Guillermo is very, like I said, very color centric. The first day we started with an office, I mean, I had the script a whole year prior to that, even though I wasn't working on it, it was percolating in my mind, uh, at least a rough draft. The first day we met, we, we basically went through the big color book and we quickly together, we, we flipped through it all and associated certain colors with certain characters. Um, and one of the main characters is Eliza, Sally Hawkins' character, and her apartment was basically in the aqua hues. You know, it, she was supposed to be, even when there was no water, it was always meant to, to feel like she was in this aqua world. The movie opens with a, a dream, sort of sleeping dream sequence where we go down the hallway and into her apartment, and there's this, this caustic light flickering through, uh, the, you know, water. It was digital water and, and done by a dry for wet technique. But after that, once, once that she wakes up and settles in, for the rest of the movie, we still wanted to keep that sort of aqua tone and that, that feel of being slightly underwater. So, you know, in the script, Guillermo had written that the light flickered through the floorboards in the, in the apartment from the theater below. So that, was, that ended up being like the, the flickering light that would come in the dream sequence came from the above, as if it was the sun rippling through the water. And then everything else in there was kind of shaped by water. All the colors were in the aqua, aqua blue colors. And it, our idea for that apartment was that it was a, Giles's apartment was on one side and hers was on the other, but it was split at one time rudely in the in the twenties. So there's sort of a deco art deco detailed wall that went between. But on her side was the remnant uh, Victorian wallpaper from the building's history, which was 1890s. Um, and then um, in that wallpaper, you know, I had Shane sourced out some beautiful wallpaper, hand printed wallpaper that were in the shape of woodblock scales. You know, so it was like fish scales as a detail that you saw it kind of at eye level. And then everything else was kind of. Um, uh, you know, quite brutally aged and, and, and worn down from water leaking in the ceiling and everything like that. And then opposite, in Giles's apartment, which is a very warm color, it was in sort of the go golds and mustards, and um, and it was lit warmly as well. It was meant to be a quite different. So you went from her cool blue aqua tones across the hall into his warm and his his warm lit place too. Uh, Dan lit his side with sort of this golden hour kind of lighting, and on. Uh, Eliza's side, it was like always a steel blue kind of color. So it was like a real contrast. But the idea was that, you know, at some point there was a grand room that got cut in half. She ended up in this rundown half, and he ended up in the really crowded half. And and he had a lot of he had more means. He had a bigger. He must have come from a house. He had a career as an illustrator. She had very little means. There was no art on the walls, nothing like that. And and Guillermo had said from the beginning that the walls itself would be like a piece of art. So this is where the heavy, heavy aged, um, patinated walls, that's where that derived from. He'd given me a photograph um, that he'd found online from an Indian uh, photography ex exhibit, and it was a real indigo blue wall with heavy aging, um, with distress on the walls from humidity. And he said, I want one of the walls to be like that. And I thought about it for a long time, and eventually I, I realized, you know, I can use inspiration for anything f to make that whatever the texture and pattern on the wall was, and I chose I thought of shapes of water, literally shapes of water, and I, in art, and I chose Hokusai's famous woodblock printing of the, the Great Wave of Kanawaga. So we superimposed that in a drawing on one of the main walls that, that we picked as our art wall, and then our scenic artist, Matthew Lamerick, painted it all in in plaster. Very, very obvious, like Gimmer walked in and goes, oh my god, Paul, it's like so literal. I said, don't, don't, don't worry, we're, we're going to knock it way back. And when we knocked it way back, essentially the mood was, you know, there was this crashing wave that went over top the entry door, so anyone coming into her world was just about to be engulfed by water. You know, So that was just these little subtle details in that apartment that no one's ever going to know without you listening to my story, but it's just we had to create a little history for ourselves, and it's just some subliminal stuff. I mean, Guillermo himself, in previous movies that I've not worked on, um, he's done, he's put little subtle details in wallpaper um, patterns that you don't really see. So I, I thought I'd take, take that idea when I, I understood that he'd done it before and, and, and develop it somewhat for this one. I mean, we're at a point now where visual effects is not a novelty anymore. It's not uh, anything that just to get a result digitally is, is any kind of an achievement. You have to be absolutely photoreal and integrated in the story. And so what we were able to do on this movie is really harness the, the best of digital effects with our you know, skills and technology, the best of makeup effects with Shane and Mike Hill, and the best of, you know, performance from, from, from Doug, who was an amazing interpreter of the role. And it kind of all came together in a unique and magical way. I came on board probably six months prior to going to camera. Um, I was finishing off another show, and we just started building the digital version of the creature. 
um, which means we interpreted Mike Hill and Shane Mahan's sculpts um, and made a completely digital version of the creature. And then we started exploratories. Um, how would his eyes blink? How would he eat? Um, should he have wrinkles on his forehead when he lifts his eyes? Um, and we worked out the methodology and kind of the personality of the creature before we went to camera because Guillermo really wants to get as much as humanly possible in the camera when he's shooting. Um, and that gives us more to work with. Um, we have great performance, great lighting. Um, and then we go in and sell the core of the creature, which is really the bulk of what we did for the show, is um, the eye and facial performance for the creature was completely digital. Yeah, I mean, in, in the early stages, I mean, Guillermo really told us that this was a film that's in love with love, which is something that you've probably heard, from, heard him say about this movie before. And right to the point, and I'll, 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 I'll let Kevin speak to this, but he really cared about the animation controls that we were generating, and he wanted to make sure that we were, A, respectful of, of Doug's performance, but B, also that he had enough control that he could do any performance digitally at any point. And do you remember when he wanted to do, yeah. literally approve the, the yeah. animation controls? Yeah. So I, I specifically remember um, Guillermo coming by my desk to check the, um, the animation facial system that we were using. And uh, he goes, I know you guys can do anything in CG, but you can't make CG fall in love. And I said to him, I said, I bet I can. And so that, that was my driving force through the whole movie is to prove that we have the, uh, the capabilities, technically, the uh, sensitivities acting wise, that we can make his expressions fall in love with, with a, a leading lady. It feels like this red coat has already become very iconic. Um, but again, a piece, of, a piece of costume which is, could it be very prosaic? I mean, it's, it's a woman's winter coat. Tell us a little bit about the, the thinking behind this. Um, I think uh, we wanted to have a... a this, Eliza starts the film being very in, in the um, shadows. Um, most of the characters, in fact, are in the shadows. And so her color palette um, is very muted and, and obviously has a lot of every shade of green in, in, in the sea. Um, but uh, there's a point in the film that, uh, you know, there's a the determination and that is represented by the color red. And uh, we see a red shoe and then we see a red accessory and then finally we see this red coat. And um, we wanted to represent that ter determination by the use of color and, and, and Guillermo. Uh, loves red, and I love red, and so we we built this this red coat, um, and it was a very specific red. It was a, a blue red um, that worked really beautifully with with uh, the water element of it, um, and it was a double knit uh, coat uh, from from that period, um, and we actually built it in two different fabrics. So the the finale of the movie when when uh, we're underwater, and I don't want to do a spoiler, but we're underwater. Um, the coat is built again in a um, different fabric so that it has movement and flow. The whole costume was actually built in, in alternate fabrics because uh, it was filmed in dry for wet. So we were in a big studio with lighting and smoke and, and recreating this underwater uh, um, aspect of the film. Does it feel like red has a particular cinematic heritage, I suppose, because you think about red shoes, you think about red balloons. Yes, you know? And obviously exactly. there's that fairy tale quality as well. I mean, exactly. I, I'm assuming all of that is, is bubbling away in the background with totally. that choice of color. Totally, okay. totally, yes. Okay. Let's go to the, the, the first storyboard. I just want to contrast. There we are. So here, a very different, Eliza. So yeah, this is the uh, dream sequence. Um, Ode to Ginger Rogers. Uh, both uh, Eliza and Giles watch old movies. And so we have a point in the, in the film where um, we have this dream sequence. And so for, th for this, you know, we were looking at all those movies and we, early discussions was let's, let's copy something completely. And then I was like, well, you know, this is a dream of hers. So let's do an interpretation. Um, and so with this dress, we started in half scale. Um, the fabric for this, for this dress actually was just shy of 10,000 Canadian dollars. Um, and we had a tight budget, so it was, it was 
a little nerve-wracking. We talk about this budget. This dress is at FIDM. Sorry? It's, a, a, yeah, yeah. it's so pretty oh, in thank person. You. Thank yeah, you so much. The fabric is beautiful. Thank you. Um, so the lace alone was $450 a meter. And so to, you know, we had to be really sure of the whole design and the line. And so we worked in, in half scale, so about that big. And we refined um, the lines and the design, and I showed Guillermo, and, and uh, we went through about five incarnations and just, you know, really fluting a bit more and, and deciding on some of the details. And then we, we did a um, full-scale uh, muslin where Sally used it during her rehearsals. So I would be sitting in the corner on the, on the floor, hiding away, watching these rehearsals to, you know, and see what I could do to enhance the dress uh, for the choreography and also, I was incredibly scared that she was going to trip. <laughs> so it was like, is it too long? Is it too short? You know, it was all of this. Once, once we were assured that we were a go, we built it in um, the real fabric. And, and there are actually four layers of fabric. There is um, chiffon um, over top of um, sequins, which was, in essence, mirroring the, the, the uh, amphibian man. Um, and then we took this lace, which um, we cut every piece of lace out and then re-put it onto a, another lace um, with the feathers. And then we put Swarovski crystals all over it. And we were putting crystals until they were like, come on, the dress has got to go. <laughs> and we had five people were gluing away. And we probably would have still be doing it now if we were, if we had the time. Um, but it was incredibly rewarding. And, and I re remember Sally putting it on uh, at the end and covering her mouth and, and just so overwhelmed thinking that she was, uh, she said, this is like a wedding dress. I, I don't know. She was just so um, <laughs> taken by it. And yeah, for me, that, that's kind of a jewel of mm. when you do something, uh, it happens. It's a, it's a magical time when, a, when an actor uh, feels so incredibly uh, whole with, with a costume um, and uh, when we shot that, which was, you know, a totally different thing from the movie. This was something that was um, black and white and glamorous, and, and it was really wonderful to, to see it come together. I mean, I wonder at this stage, actually, how much you're designing for the character and how much you're designing for, you know, in, in the case of Shape of Water, Sally Hawkins. I mean, were you also going back and looking at Sally's work in the past and thinking about her as well as Eliza? Well, you're always looking, um, you're always considering uh, your your, your actors, their physicality, um, their um, elements that they feel most comfortable with, don't feel comfortable with, enhance what, what needs to be enhanced. And, and so, um, yeah, I think in working, in working with Sally and any of the actors, uh, there is always a melding of both creative and, and the actual mm -hmm. physical elements of, of creating a character where, um, you have limitations and challenges, and, and so it's a healthy balance. Sure. Kind of a main uh, early motivation for where we pulled the sounds from for the creature uh, was actually Doug Jones on set. The, so he's the, he's the actor who played the, uh, the role of the creature. And, uh, and on set, he was making some kind of like uh, uh, sounds. Like he was making these sort of guttural clicky sounds, like they almost yeah. felt like glottal clicks that he was making uh, to communicate with Eliza. And that was just part of the character that he was playing. Um, that paired with just his presence, that sort of matador stance that he took, um, those were sort of big motivators for the kind of uh, expression that I wanted to bring to him. Beyond that, it was, um, it was just sort of uh, exploring, exploring what, what, we, what I could do. Because the, 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 the base layer of the creature's voice is my own voice. And so, you know, I had the microphone in my studio at home was like a bottomless pit of material. I could just turn it on and explore and see what I could do. And, uh, and you know, that all springboarded off of what, what Doug gave us in his physical performance. And what he did, we were able to capture. It wasn't a, you know, I didn't mic the creature or anything intentionally. It was just, uh, it just happened organically, I guess you could say it the same time as Michael Shannon's character is, is torturing this creature and, and whatnot, so. Uh, the water, from our perspective, was, um, it was a kind of a metaphor for love. Uh, the creature can't live 
without love, the creature can't live without water. He can live outside of water for a while. Um, and so, you know, it played a big, it, it, it played a big character in the movie. There was a whole conversation between me and, uh, and one, of, uh, one of the sound effects editors on the team, Tyler Whittem, where the rainstorm at the end had to be a character in itself. We wanted to show up with um, an immense amount of detail for that. Uh, for that storm, and uh, just because, like that's that really embodied the turning of the tables, right? The, it, it felt to me like the creature's world was falling down from the sky onto this world, right? And we wanted to make it feel like that. Um, so yeah, Tyler, Tyler did a lot of very specific textured, detailed uh, water surface recordings and uh, and things like that. And he wasn't the only one. Everyone kind of pitched in on that front. We all kind of, if we heard something, I know that like Kevin Howard contributed some some water movement in his bathtub at home. I did the same. I have a skylight. We had a lot of rain in Toronto that year, so it was always possible to throw a microphone somewhere and catch something, get something that would be used in the movie. And most of it did. Most of it found its way in. Um, you know, whether it was massive curtains of rain sweeping across the docks at the end of the movie, or even just like little little ear candy textures yeah. like the waters, the water driplets hitting the, the foreground side view mirror when Strickland is staking out. Yeah, there's also um, a little detail if you if you listen to that track and, yeah. and we were able to play with a lot of, a lot in the room and, and a lot of movement and like you'd get and it was, uh, yeah, there was lots of nice little detail we were able to bring into all those moments. Water gave us a, a good opportunity to provide a lot of depth to the yeah. world because it was such a, an omnipresent source of sound. Oh, it's own character, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was interesting how you came to filmmaking because you, you studied in Guadalajara and you mm -hmm. helped set up you know, the film societies there and you, you the university, festival. the festival, yeah. which is a fantastic <laughs> festival. And then you studied, you also studied script writing under a very good Mexican director called um, James Humberto Hermosillo, yeah. who yeah. you didn't get on too well with, as I understand yeah. it. No, I did get along with him, yeah. The, the thing is, I think he was very, very strict. I thank him for that. We, he teaches a screenplay for three years. Mm -hmm. He is truly the basis of everything I do. Because we wouldn't really have had Kronos if not for him, because as I understand it, you originally wrote The Devil's Backbone, or the script that became The Devil's Backbone, yeah. and he didn't like the way it was presented. The margins yeah. weren't right, so he threw it in the bin. He threw it, he ripped it. Yeah. I've spent two years trying to make it, and he flips through it, and he says, the margins are wrong. <laughs> and he says, come back to me when you are willing to be tidy with your work, and he threw it in the wastebasket. And I go, you know what? I'm not going to write it again, and I'm not going to graduate. Screw this.